Well, uh, Robbie, let me start with you. You went through this period of your life writing your memoir, Testimony. I wonder if there was something different about having Daniel put it on film. Well, it was the focus. You know, in, the, in Testimony, I'm writing a very broad horizon of a story, you know, from when I was a little kid and up through up through the last walls, as we see, and uh, and Daniel had to figure out in this film, you know, we're not making uh, Gone with the Wind here. We've got to focus on a certain period in this time, and I was I was surprised and I was impressed with the idea of going to a place and because in these kind of these rock and roll documentary things about people oh my god look what happened and then this happened and all of these stories he found a way to make this so moving and so emotional and I didn't see that coming and when I saw the first assemblage, rough cut, whatever you could, want to call it, of this, I thought, this is quite beautiful. And the fact that it was, it was touching to me, and that he had the, the sense to go in a direction like that, which is night and day to what a lot of these kind of films are, that was very, very rewarding. Um, just as a quick aside to that, there's a moment in the film when Robbie describes playing this record he made with the with the band Music from Big Pink for Bob Dylan, and uh, Dylan like here's the first song. He's like, who wrote that? Whose song is that? And then Robbie's like, I wrote that. And then Bob's like, you wrote that? That's your song? And my experience at that moment was when Robbie saw the rough cut. He's like, that's your movie. That's what you made. <laughs> and that was, you know, there were many art imitating like moments in this, and that was one that, that meant a great deal to me, because he's like, all right, you made something great, cool. Uh, so Daniel, can you talk about the process of excavating the archival footage? Uh, I mean, Robbie said that even in the process, you surprised him with things that you found. Well, first and foremost, as I'm looking out at the audience, I see Elliot Landy sitting out there, who is the photographer who probably shot yeah. Elliot yeah. Landy, uh, my old buddy. To uh, set up for the audience what we're seeing of Elliot's work in there. I mean, like, almost everything. Like, <laughs> Elliot was the guy who shot the band. I mean, the iconic look of the group, sort of the old Western um, uh, Matthew Brady inspiration that the group is known for, that was because of Elliot's creative uh, a vision. Um, and he's obviously in the film as well. But for me, making the documentary is very much a question of uh, trying to leave no stone unturned and find every single piece of archive. And so you can do you know, a surface level dig, but then you can like call widows of photographers and ask to come over. Um, and you know, I was like a pain in Elliot Landy's ass for like a year and a half, going over to his house you know, every six months, begging him to see his negatives until very reluctantly he let me take, take a look through that material. Um, but it's just having that sort of doggedness to try and find whatever it is, whatever it is that's out there that no one has seen before. And Elliot's photos are absolutely iconic in the annals of rock and roll history, but there's a lot of photos that uh, I was interested in seeing that I had never seen before, that, that ha hadn't been published, um, and they just take the story and elevate it and bring it to life. And so I'm so grateful for Elliot's contribution, but also for uh, you know, so many of the other photographers and, and estates and families that were willing to give us access to this remarkable material. There was a thing in this world at that time with the band in this world that we lived in up in uh, the mountains in Woodstock, New York um, with you know, Bob Dylan and Albert Grossman and everybody and, and we didn't want anybody coming in. We didn't want anybody walking on our lawn and we 
invited Elliot Landy in, and he was the only one that came in and saw what was really going on. He was part of the family. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, Robbie, during the film, we were at a dinner with, at a long table, and I was at one end and you were at the other, but uh, I caught a snatch of conversation where I heard you referring to the Chelsea Hotel that's uh, just down the street. And because we're in New York City, even though you're a West Coast guy now and you're a Woodstock guy from uh, the band days, I wonder if there are memories of New York City um, that are strong for you. Well, there's a lot of memories that are very strong for me, but I can't tell you about them. Uh, it's just down and dirty. Uh, but you know what? I, I, I've got to share something with you tonight because I didn't, you know, we were, we didn't know whether we could talk about this or we couldn't talk about that. But this movie is going to be distributed by Magnolia Films, one of the coolest film companies on the planet Earth, and I am honored to be part of that. And so, they have announced it's going to open in New York and LA on February the 21st, and then nationwide on the 28th. And it is, they're just the best at this. So we are in really good hands. Thank you, Eamon, for inviting us in. Thank you so much. Uh, Daniel, I want to ask you, you know, it's been pointed out, you were a young director that Robbie entrusted. And when it came down to doing these interviews that are, you know, probing interviews, you know, getting into difficult parts, what was that process uh, like for you? What was the you know, toughest interview that you felt you had to do or the toughest question you felt you had to ask? Well, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, when you go to an interview, especially with these very important high-profile musical artists, I try to be mindful of the fact that these people have to do this every day, and it's kind of like motions that they go through. So you want to try and extract something that's a little bit different. And it's about energy. Sometimes you, you click with, with an individual and, and you get them on a good day. When we shot uh, the interview with Eric Clapton, for example, I, I had no idea that he was going to talk so candidly about uh, addiction and substance abuse. Um, but he did. Um, and there are other interviews that were a little bit more challenging and uh, a little bit more difficult. Um, but ultimately, it was just knowing the, the material and knowing exactly what I wanted to extract from each interview and just having a vision and an idea of how that piece of the puzzle would fit into that broader narrative. And Robbie, what was that process like for you? You processed these stories writing uh, your own memoir, but you, you give a very moving account of, uh, you know, of a lot of critical points in, in your life. When Daniel's sitting across from you trying to extract these stories, what was that like for you? Well, it was interesting telling somebody from a completely different generation about something that he was really interested in, but I knew that it was so distant. It was such a departure, and that made it inspiring because I, I, I felt like I'm actually telling some, you something that you don't know anything about, but you're fascinated by, and I'm going to enlighten you. <laughs> uh, you know, the film has this focus um, on the band. Uh, you've had a long career uh, since then, and one of the things that comes across in the film is the way this group of people inspired each other and made something special. And I wonder, as you've moved on to other phases of your career, it's always interesting to hear from someone who's had a career of such longevity and reinvention. What, what are the things that you've done along the way to kind of reinvigorate you or, or reignite your creative energy? I don't know. I, th I wake up in the morning every day thinking, uh, OK, what's the discovery process now? What, and I'm just, I'm just a very curious soul, so I'm always trying to uncover something and 
find, you know, it, it's something that I didn't have before. I want to look at things from a different angle. Um, and, and I've been very fortunate after this whole amazing experience with the band that, you know, I've been, you know, spent all these years working with Martin Scorsese and, and being able to make records about things that truly, uh, that, that I thought, I, I can do this. I don't know anybody else that it's their job, but I can do this. I can make music about this part of my heritage, about the North American Indian, you know, a sound. I can do this, and and damn it, I think they're going to let me get away with this. So I've been able to explore, discover, and it's an ongoing process. And I'm so fortunate that after all this time, like. Right now, I have this new album that's just come out, cinematic, that connects to the Irishman that I just did the score for, and I'm, and I'm also the executive music producer on, and I have the 50th anniversary of the band's album. It's now just put together the co uh, collector's edition of that, and, and I'm writing the second part, volume two of my memoir, um, I get, you know, it's all going on, and I should be sipping lemonade on an island somewhere, but I don't have time. Uh, Daniel, uh, what was it about the band that first drew you in? Well, I, I grew up in Toronto, and one thing about Canadians is that we worship our own. And aside from perhaps the soul of the band, Levon Helm, that is a very Canadian group. And, uh, you know, I have fond memories of being uh, in northern Ontario on canoe trips and, and singing, you know, the Night Day Dribble Dixie Down as I'm meandering down some portage, very Canadian moment. Um, and there was something about that music that, that the whole canon, whether it's the band or Joni or Neil or Dylan, just that generation. Uh, I was always drawn to, but the band specifically, I spoke to it a bit in my opening remarks, there was just an ethos to that music. It took me somewhere. Bruce Springsteen sums it up beautifully in the film. It sounded completely, completely new, but like it's always been there, you know, this, this, this sort of an antiquity to it. And, uh, you know, I was just always a huge fan. When I was in high school, I did a, a project where I, I did these giant illustrations to the lyrics of, of The Night They Drove with Dixie Down, and the music just always resonated. So when the book came out and I saw that maybe there was an opportunity to make this film, I just you know, uh, uh, ran for it with all the, the gusto and strength that I had, because I knew that, I just sort of convinced myself that I had to do it. And once I convinced myself of that, it was just a question of convincing the rest of the world, uh, <laughs> which was a, a bigger task. Um, but it seems to have worked out. Uh, and and yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Robbie, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll have the time to ask a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Martin Scorsese is the executive producer of this. You talked about uh, working on the score for uh, The Irishman. You've had a long uh, history of collaborations uh, with him. Um, can you uh, talk about you know what it's like that collaboration? You know how you begin ideas for creating musical scores for his work. It's it's different every time out of the box, and the first af after we did the last walls, um, when he was doing Raging Bull, he said, uh, "Can you help me out with a couple of things here? I need something for this movie and." And they were like, it was almost like chores. There was stuff that needed to be done. He said, can you do, you know, some of the source music for it, you know? Uh, um, and the, this Mascani music that we're going to use, some of it doesn't sound as good as it needs to for the movie. Could you fix that up? And, uh, and I had some ideas for some of the songs that were used in the movie. So we just started stirring this thing up. 
And then when we were done and this movie came out, Raging Ball, I thought, now that's the shit. That's something right there. I've never seen or felt a music experience in a movie quite like that before. And it, it, it drew me in to that world in a, in a way that I, I, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know I wanted to go there. And then the next movie he was doing, so it was like, so what are we gonna do on this one? And then on and on and on. And like I said, every time, it's a, we come in a different door. And it's a different way of trying to do something that isn't the obvious. It isn't, I've never, I, which, you know, it's, it's not my thing to, to, you know, to have a big 50-piece orchestra and do traditional music for a movie. And, you know, and, and, and to be working with somebody who keeps reminding me um, well, whatever you're doing, it's good, as long as it doesn't sound like movie music. So you think, oh, <laughs> okay, so we throw out everything and start from scratch here and try again to discover something that isn't just, you know, the formula. And every time working with Marty to be that free from the formula is really, really inspiring. So we are already starting to work on the music for the next movie, After the Irishman, um, which I'm really excited about, and, uh, and I hope we don't get tired. I'd have time to take uh, a couple of questions. Do we have microphones? Uh, no, no, we don't. Okay, so uh, take a question right here. Yeah. Thank you. Both. I'll repeat the question. Thank you, both. Do you want me to? I don't want to take it. You can use it, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you both for coming. You've both been through this very involved, now two and a half year long process, I think it's two and a half years, of making a film, and I wonder what both of you take away from it. What do you both get from having now basic experience, both you having now met all these people and, and, and interviewed and gotten their stories, and you also retelling and, and in a way reliving many of the stories from your past? Robbie, let me go first. I have a lot to say about this. Go. Go. So when I, uh, sort of the knowledge that I carry forward when I think about the, the process of making this film is really the sort of the, the lessons I've taken away from studying this man's life so closely, and for me, you know, it's interesting to be a young man studying the life of someone who's a little bit older than me, but making a film about them when they were my age. And what I spent a lot of time thinking about was what it takes to have a great life, and the vision and ambition that it took for Robbie Robertson to have the life that he did. And, you know, it's the type of thing where in life you can make consequential decisions and do things that are outside of your comfort zone, and drop out of high school and go down and join a Southern Rockabilly band, and then go on tour where you get booed every night, and then go up into the mountains, and, and it's like, it's vision and ambition, and just having um, this, this idea of what you want to achieve. And seeing your life, it, it taught me to, to sort of frame my life not in, you know, the focus of what am I going to be doing in, in a month or a year, but it's like, what am I going to be doing in five years or ten years? Um, and that's something that I'm very grateful for, and it just reminded me to, to have the courage to be bold and ambitious and have vision of, of my dreams and what do I want to achieve, because his dreams, you know, had no bounds, and he went out and he did the impossible. And that's something that I learned making this film that I'm eternally grateful for, that I'll always um, uh, have cl be close to my thoughts, sort of. Yeah. Ditto. <laughs> All right, uh, woman back there, so please, yeah, stand up and... Hi, um, so there was so much, okay, hi, there was so much emphasis on how your family was such an important part of your sanity in the movie, and I just, I know that, um, Richard and Rick didn't, you know, make it as much as you did, but, like, did they have strong women in their lives, too? Because I can't find anything about it on the internet. <laughs> uh, so the uh, question was about how family is such an important part of your life movie and keeping you solid and 
she was asking about other members of the band, Richard Rick, if they had, you know, important women in their life that uh, uh, that you could shed light on. Um, the in the brotherhood of the band, it was a family, and you know, and as we you know talked about that, that in, when we made music from Big Pink, there was a a very trendy thing in rock and roll, like your families are, you know, evil, and you hate your father, and you hate your mother, and everything, and, and when we told Elliot that we were going to go up and take a picture with the families and everything, it was so against the grain, but never did anybody ever say or ever think Oh, you're doing this to be different. No, it was genuine. And because of that family connection, the guys in the band for a, a long time, they lived at my mother's house. And it, you know, this family oriented thing. So Rick was incredible with kids. He was, yeah, he was such a special soul in that kind of way. And Richard had this gentle heart in this thing that you could feel a mile away. And Levon as much, and Garth. And so anyway, our connection together was con contagious. And we all, now along this path too, there was a lot of bumps in the road and people went this way and went that way and you know it wasn't just completely normal or defined it never is but anyway at the heart of this thing was an incredible family oriented world and it came out in the music as well um we're going to leave it there the film comes out in February 23rd. You're the first audience, I think. February 21st. The excuse me. February 21st. In New York and L.A. and the 28th nationwide. Thank the you. man who knows his work. I hope you get to see more films over the next nine days at NYC. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks especially to Daniel Roar and Robbie Robertson. <laughs>